Hello, everyone. Welcome to Oak Ridge First Cumberland Presbyterian Church's virtual Sunday school option. I'm Patricia Pace, and we like to call this the Not So Sunday Sunday School because it's not recorded on a Sunday, and you do not have to watch it on a Sunday or be at church to participate. Um, we are in a new series on spiritual disciplines, and last uh, week we introduced the importance of spiritual disciplines. So today we're going to talk about the spiritual discipline about studying God's word. In Hebrews 4 12 says that God's word, the word of God is living and active. And so how true is that? How many times have you picked up scripture and read? So scripture that was written thousands of years ago, but yet is it's pertinent and it applies to your own personal life in that moment of time. So Scripture is living and active, and that's how we can know God's promises and we, how we can know directions. So this is a definitely an important spiritual discipline, uh, like many of the others, and I will share my screen. We always have a little PowerPoint that goes along with the lesson. Okay, so we take our... Um, study from LifeWise Bible Studies for Life. And we are on the spiritual disciplines becoming more like Jesus. And if you would like a copy of the personal study guide each week with a direct YouTube link, you can email me, you can send me a text, and I'll be glad to share that with you. Let's see. So uh, we are taking our scripture from Psalm 119, verses 17 to 24. And the point is our hearts are satisfied as we encounter God through his word. So thinking about instructions, because the word of God is our instruction. It's a direct line to us. It's how God speaks to us in our lives. So let's think about directions and instructions. When have bad directions or instructions led you astray? Have you ever been lost? Uh, this is from the internet, narcity.com. And the story behind this is this past December, two hikers in British Columbia, they got lost in the woods at night because, and this is on Mount Seymour, they hiked following tracks left behind of other skiers. But following these other skiers led them way too far and they were stuck in the deep snowy woods. And it was snowing, darkness was coming, but it has a good ending. There was a rescue team that was able through night vision equipment to spot them and, uh, and get them, they rappel down to where they were. So for these two hikers at Mount Seymour, following ski tracks led them astray and left them in danger. So think about times when we have followed something, either other people, what they've done before, or any kind of directions where it may have led us astray. Um, and I think this especially happens when we're younger Maybe uh, your friend group when you're in middle school, think about did you, did you get led astray by any middle school or high schoolers following the wrong thing? And then I have a cute video. Um, GPS, I have a love-hate relationship with it. And I don't really have a machine in my car, but on my phone, I have Google Maps. And sometimes it can lead you in the right direction, sometimes a little off. But uh, this is really cute. It's just about a minute or so. And it's southern directions through a GPS. What's up, man? How you doing? Let me figure out the best way to get you there. Well, this way will get you there quicker than a jackrabbit. I reckon y'all get there around quarter of two. Quarter of two? Is that 2.15? The, the phone says 145. A piece down the road. You'll see an old church that's now a shelter. And then two churches catty corner after that. OK, be on the lookout. How far is a piece? At the second red light, take a right. Wait, was that was that the second red light? Look, you done gone too far, hang on. Oh, great, we passed it. All right, y'all stay on this road, then take a right at the fork after you pass the Wilkins place. Otherwise, you'll have to grease the wagon twice before hitting the main road again. Okay, right at the fork, done. You'll think you're lost or leaving the country. Turn right just before you get to the shell. Or is it a Chevron? Pretty sure it's a shell. Place we used to go to sometimes to get slush puppies, Last time you had a slush puppy. Take a ride up there and your destination will be just over yonder. Over yonder? How far is that? It says it's a hop, skip, and a jump away. Your destination is over by where Chuck and them live. Oh, come on. You done gone too far. Hang on. 
Never mind, you're good. So, definitely a uh, cute little video, and we've probably heard those phrases in Southern Directions. Uh, I've not heard grease the wheels twice. I don't know. I have to look that up and see what that means. But before we actually get into our Bible study and our Sunday school lesson, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, please help us to understand the importance of spending time with you in your word. And thank you so much for the precious gift of the Bible. Okay, so our first section here is going to be in Psalm 119, 17 through 18. And let's talk a little bit about the background here of the psalm. Psalm 119, if you didn't know it, was is one of the longest of the 150 psalms, or it is the longest, of the 150 Psalms in the Bible. It has 176 verses, but rest assured, we are not going to be studying 176 verses today. And it is an acrostic poem. So that means each section begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And you don't have to worry about that either because we won't be reading it in Hebrew. So this is often identified, Psalm 119 is a wisdom song, uh, psalm. And so it was designed to give instruction in right living, right faith, and in the vein of all the other wisdom literature, such as Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. So Psalm 1 and Psalm 19, they're also wisdom psalms, if you want to go back and look at those. All three, Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 119, they extol the virtues of the person who is grounded in the word of God. So go ahead and read these two verses to yourself, and then we'll kind of talk about them. So here, the overall theme is delighting in the word of God. And the writer describes his relationship with God as God's servant. Be good to your servant. So a servant, that implies that he had been faithful to God in his actions, that he's a good servant. Um, the psalmist also prayed that God would deal generously with him. Uh, be good to your servant uh, so that he might live and obey God's word. So this is really like a prayer for help as he struggled to live in God's word in a world that seems so opposite. So think about our world today. It's kind of, it can be opposite of God's word. So be good to your servant while I live that I may obey your word. And he's also recognizing his request uh, for God's help in this. Um, so his desire is to obey God's word even in a world that doesn't. So the second print request was, first was uh, be good so that I may obey your word. Uh, but the second request in verse 18 was would be that God would open his eyes. So that's an image that we see a lot in scripture. The opening of a person's eyes is kind of like a metaphor for gaining insight or seeing with clarity for understanding the truth. And don't we want those things when we read the word of God? So going back and looking at some examples in the Bible about people who've been blinded, sort of the opposite of having your eyes open or that you're blind. Uh, in Matthew 15, 14, uh, Jesus replies to the Pharisees being offended, to him being working on a Sunday, to leave them. They are blind gods. So the Pharisees he referred to as blind gods. And there's several times that Jesus refers to the way of the Pharisees as blindness to God and his ways. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul describes unbelievers as people who have been blinded to the truth. And so we know, everybody's heard the account of Paul being blinded on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, 8. But when he trusted God and received the Holy Spirit, Luke wrote, down in Acts, something like scales fell from his eyes. And that's Acts 9, 19. So that's just the image that his eyes were blinded, covered with scales until he accepted the Holy Spirit and, and Christ's word and message. So when we come into this world, we don't enter it knowing and able to see God's word. And even after we follow the Lord as the baby Christians, we still 
And as mature Christians, we still need the Spirit's illumination to understand it. So we could read and comprehend the Bible, but it's the Holy Spirit in us that illuminates, that reveals the truth for us. So the psalmist here, it's a spiritual plea to God that he grant him the understanding of God, his word, and his ways. And this reminded me of a good hymn, and I'm just going to play like 42 seconds of it. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God I will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Okay. So there you go. That can be a earworm, as they call it. After putting this on here, I kind of was humming it for several days. But how important that when we go to read God's word, we ask him to open our eyes and open our hearts that we may see the truth that he wants to share with us. And if we go back to the scripture, um, the psalmist identifies his desire behind his request. Why, Why should you open my eyes? but it's that he wants to see wonderful things from God's law. And so the Hebrew term translated see, open my eyes that I may see, the see in this verse means to think intently. So in a spiritual sense, we think meditate on, open my eyes that I might meditate in your law. And we'll get to that later on about meditating on scripture. Okay, so we can grow spiritually. Let's see, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. When has God revealed himself to you in a fresh way through his word? Um, When has God revealed himself to you in a fresh way um, through his word? Well, I think, and I probably everybody, this is true. It seems like, Sometimes you can read things in the Bible for many years, but depending on your circumstances and what you're going through, it God reveals this message in a different way to you. Um, so I've had that happen to me a lot. Um, and, and going back to the Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is living and active. And I believe it's so personal to us and that it stood the test of time that, um, it reveals that when you read this Bible that lots and millions of people have read, those pieces of scripture, God is speaking to you himself through personally. So I don't know, it's just hard for me to wrap my mind around how God, because we can't do it, obviously. So what are ways that God has revealed himself in a fresh way through his word? So lasting truths in Psalm 119, 17 through 18. Real living is not bountiful outside the realm of God's word. Our eyes need the Holy Spirit's illumination to see the wonders of God's word. We grow stronger in our faith as we understand God's word more. And, you know, I think that just goes hand in hand. The more mature we are and the stronger we are, uh, the more we see the truth and are revealed the truth. uh, And it's, it's just wonderful. Okay, so we grow spiritually as we encounter God through his word. In these verses, we're going to see that knowing God through his word can help us face opposition. So read these four verses from Psalm 119, 19 through 22. So these verses reveal that once scripture is understood, 
Understanding is not the only step, but then it has to be put to work through personal obedience. So here the psalmist, you could kind of relate him to like a weary traveler in a forging world, but he was not afraid to ask for directions. So he's asking God for directions. He didn't feel at home in the world, but he felt perfectly at peace in God's word. So how many of us, like this first line, I'm a stranger on earth, have just felt like we are so different than the people around us sometimes. And so uh, sometimes when you work in a, in maybe, and probably maybe even in a Christian environment, but you can think, I just think so differently. And sometimes I've even said that I don't think anybody in this world thinks like me sometimes, but um, we can feel isolated sometimes uh, from earth because if you're a stranger on earth and the CSB version calls it, calls it a resident alien. Um, and there is a whole long line of people in the Bible who really recognized or through scripture have shared with us or their stories that, this world was not their home. We're really not supposed to be super comfortable here on earth. So Moses, Abraham, the children of Israel, Peter, all of those had made, had made comment that the world was not their ultimate home. So looking at verses 21 uh, and on, here it talks about him suffering persecution for his love and loyalty to God's word. The last one, remove from me their scorn and contempt for I keep your statutes. So we kind of uh, assume from that, that because he kept God's word, that he was persecuted in some way. And I think today that um, persecution can not be extreme. There is extreme persecution, obviously, but it can be small social persecutions or things that make you feel different or where you have to stand differently than other people uh, because you love the Lord. So here he's recognizing that he can't deal with it alone. So he's got to reach out to God uh, to deal with these realities that he's facing. And his true safety and security were to be found in a relationship with God and obedience to God. And how do we know what God wants us to do? Well, we go through the scripture to know. So in the face of what he was experiencing, whatever was going on with the psalmist, his greatest was concern was that the possibility that God might hide his commands from him. Because um, he says, do not hide your commands from me. So he really recognized that the centrality of God and his word was everything to him. And I think that we need to kind of think that too, you know, imagine if we didn't have the Bible. Wow. You know, and so how important the Bible and his word is to us. And so today, as Christians, we face very similar situations. Those who follow God and obey his word sometimes are not well received by society. Sometimes they are. Sometimes it depends on the environment you're in. So society, and we see this more and more, but it tends to revel in what's wrong and mock those who do not stand up for what's right. You're not tolerant enough or you're not compassionate enough. So um, we know that one day all opposition to God will cease. I mean, there is ultimate victory because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So we know that's going to happen, but there's going to be some rough times in between. So how has knowing God through his word helped you face challenges in life? So thinking about this is a little litmus test here, you could say the word should be our litmus. It should be our test, everything that we compare to for our actions and our thoughts. So helping you through your challenges, you need to look objectively at your life and ask yourself if the choices you make actually reflect Jesus. And if not, change your choices. And also I think, you know, whatever you're going through, look and dive into the word. And there's so many resources out there that can help you, commentaries and uh, supplements to the Bible that can help you get into the word um, and look for things, but see what it says regarding your situation. So whether you need physical healing, emotional well-being, a loved one who you feel like needs to be saved, financial provision, some type of blessing, there are all scriptures and promises throughout the Bible. And so look to that to see what God says. Um, lasting truths. 
in Psalm 119, 19 through 22. We are not at home in this world, but are yearning for our homeland, which is with God in heaven. Desire for the word of God to be crucial in maintaining spiritual discipline. So that desire to read, it's crucial. Um, God will deal with those who opposes his people in his time and his way. So we will go through difficult times and difficult experiences and different levels of persecution, but God will take care of that. We just have to know and, and desire his word and live in his word and use that as our litmus test for our actions and thoughts. Okay, so now in these verses, we're going to see that knowing God through his word helps us to have perspective. So read these two verses. So persecution, nothing new for God's people. The writer of the book of Hebrews provided an excellent summary of all the long history of those faithful to God and his word who suffered persecution uh, and who stood in opposition to God, his word, and his people. So just look up Hebrews 11 and you can see a history that this is not, persecution is not a one-time thing only. But the response of the psalmist in this to officials that um, persecuted him was that he thought about God's decrees. Your servant will meditate on your decrees. So he's going to meditate on God's word. So when faced with danger, the psalmist looked to God and his word for security. So where do you go for comfort? Where do you go to, as refuge in a written form? God's word. And that's how God can, one way that God can speak to you. Um, and the psalmist refocused on God's perspective. And how many times have we had a perspective and then we go read the Bible and it changes us? So when we're faced with persecution or any bad experience, we kind of have two choices. We can turn to God in faith or we can move away from hurt, with, move away from God in hurt or anger, doubt, fear, all of those things. So run to God, run away from God. But in focusing on God and his word, the psalmist didn't deny any realities of his situation. He was still going through a difficult time. He wasn't in denial, but he didn't dwell on it either. Instead, his focus was on God's statutes. And God's statutes, in verse 24, your statutes are my delight. He loved God and his word. And they were also his counselors. So with God's word at the center of his life, God's guidance and advice were readily available to this psalmist to guide him in all situations he encountered. And that's true for us today. God's word can help us know God's will, God's guidance, God's advice in any situation. So godly people are important because we it's important to have friends that can give you godly counsel, but they cannot replace God's word. God's word is the only perfect, infallible source of guidance. Use that along with your godly friends too. But God's word is should be the central authority in your life, my life. So thinking about perspective, here's a cute little cartoon. When has your perspective on something been changed because of God's word? Thinking about that, your perspective on something been changed. Well, there's been times I might say I might be mad or angry situations. And then I go into God's word and see what God says about anger and about how you should treat people that treat you wrong and about loving. Um, so that's a perspective that's changed. Um, and I think not necessarily perspective, but it can strengthen your hope and your endurance, you know, reading through his promises. What about you? How has your perspective on something been changed? And also, I think it can, you know, when we, when, we call, when we ask God to reveal to us, and I think Larry had this verse in um, church last Sunday, and it was from, let me pull it up real quick here. Um, it was from Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Um, I'm going to pull it up so I don't give you fake fake, uh, fake things here. Wouldn't want to do that. Um, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And I think 
you know, asking God, look, do you see anything in me that needs to change? What truth can you show me through reading your word? Um, because sometimes we can be blinded to those parts of us and scripture can help bring that out if we're open to it and allow the Holy Spirit to work with us. So lasting truths from this section of Psalms, those who stand on God's word may face opposition. I mean, that's just how it is. Knowing God's word, word gives us perspective, his perspective. The word of God guides us and advises us how to make better decisions in our life. And we should rely on that as our central authority. So five ways to get into God's word. Um, and this came from, uh, I think from the Bible series. And so thinking about how can you just, instead of just opening up your Bible, but you, you can get into God's word in diff different methods. You can read it, you can hear it, you can study it and, I mean, there's just a million things. You can memorize it and you can meditate on it. So all of those are ways that you can encounter God through his word. So if there's one of these that you're not really utilizing right now, maybe you're not meditating or maybe you have a, a desire to memorize, uh, you can do that. Uh, maybe picking up a different Bible study. Okay, so encountering God through his word, uh, what a blessing that we have his word so that we can know his statutes, we can know his promises, we can know his decrees, it can give us comfort and hope, and we use that as our litmus test for our actions and our thoughts. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the spiritual discipline of prayer, so let's end in a prayer. Dear God, we ask that you give us a deeper passion and desire for your word. And thank you for speaking to us and empowering us through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Everybody have a wonderful week uh, and we'll see you next Sunday or whenever you watch. <laughs>